All right, welcome back everyone. I thought we would take a little bit of time just to go over some of the week two material in terms of talking about soundscapes. So I think one of the things that you probably have discovered in looking at some of the media and doing some of the readings is that this is a pretty new and innovative area in terms of looking at sound and looking at music. And one of my reflections from being a music major back in the day is that, you know, very often we don't talk about sound around us. We don't talk about ambient sound. And uh, it reminds me a little bit of the work of John Cage, the famous experimental composer who wrote a famous piece called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds that we'll probably look at in our uh, week that we talk about experimental music. But one of the things about that piece is that it's uh, four minutes and 33 seconds of sitting at the piano, not playing a single note. And it really offers opportunities to listen very carefully and critically at the sound in a concert hall or wherever that piece is being performed. So I think one of the things that sound mapping and looking at soundscapes allows us to do is to really more critically understand our sonic and musical worlds around us. Now, one thing I wanted to mention is I really recommend if you go to either the website or the app called Echoes. So the app is, is pretty cool and the app allows you to do sound walks of various types and you can search by geography you can explore sound walks near you and these are narrated tales if you will that have audio and sonic components and so if you if you get a chance download the echoes app and check it out now if you go to their website which is echoes e c h o e s dot x y z you can download and use their creator app which is equally cool or in some ways cooler so what you'd want to do is just go to the website here and click on free apps. And then specifically, you would look at the Get Creator here, which is free without any ads. Um, it, actually, it's, it's not working on my phone, so it could be an issue with my phone because this error was, was coming up. But I did get it to work a few days ago, and what's cool about this is you could create your own sonic map of a space and it'll map it for you with GPS. You can add key points or map points and then you can add like a sound that is associated with that point or also a narration. So definitely if you get a chance, check this out. I think it's one of the cooler things that you can um, work with in terms of just having this ability to look more critically at sound. Okay, so right now, let's jump back here and look at some additional musical examples as we talk more critically about sound this week and sound that exists in our various environments. Okay, so we're back here um, in the studio setup just looking at some principles of thinking about sound in everyday life. And one of the cool things I think about studying soundscapes and doing some work in this week and the weeks coming is to really think more critically about the sonic and musical environments around us. In some cases, music and sound obviously can coincide with one another. In other cases, we don't think of maybe the tapping on a table um, as a form of music, but indeed it could um, be considered musical. So what I want to talk a little bit about today is just the idea of using sounds in your everyday environment to create different possibilities of artistic expressions or even just pure experiments with sound. So one of the handy things you can get involved in is something called a piezo or a contact microphone. And this is a microphone that unlike say this microphone here is picking up vibrations and not sound through the air. So anything that vibrates or has any kind of percussive or metallic or any number of sounds to it can be used in a setup like this. Now there are really cheap piezo microphones you can get. Some of them look like this minus the epoxy and this is a special microphone made by a sound artist named Crank Sturgeon and uh, because of the epoxy you can use it with water and we'll look at how water um, and uh, some simple alka seltzer could be used in, in some new sonic ways. We don't typically think of taking sounds inside of water or creating sounds inside of water, but it does create a different kind of acoustical scenario, if you will. So this is one of the more expensive contact microphones made by Zeppelin Design Labs called the Cortado MK3. And I heard a story about how they actually took 100 of these or 200 of these and put them under um, a football stadium during an NFL game to get a very interesting sound. So again, this is going to amplify anything that has a vibration to it. I could use it, say, with a kalimba and I'm actually not monitoring the sound right now, so we'll see how this 
actually does sound, just because I'm not entirely sure what it's going to sound like. And one of the cool things, and you can actually see this particular kalimba has these what seem like noisemakers on it, these little metal beads. And what you could do if you're playing this is actually try to create a rhythm with, not very good at it, but you could create a rhythm while you're playing. Or you could just enjoy the timbral possibilities of this. Again, I think what's cool about non-Western instruments is sometimes you see something like this and you say, why would you want to add a noisemaker to something that already has a particular timbre or a type of tone or quality to it in terms of its sound. Well, it changes the timbre, and these are easily removable, but when you play them, you can see that it, it just creates a different sonic experience. And so if you're thinking about in the future, maybe building an instrument for your final project, you could take inspiration from everyday real instruments like this kalimba, or Imbira, and uh, think about how something like buzzers on the tines or the keys of a kalimba have that possibility to really take your sound and your performance in a different direction. And this is why I think it's really important um, if we don't typically think about sound itself and the quality of sound, say if we're practicing an instrument or we're in music school, this is an opportunity really to think more about the timbral qualities of instruments and sound and not just about some notion of pure musicality or performance that maybe comes from an instrument. So. It's really cool to experiment with some of these possibilities. And again, sound artists are doing a lot of this work using things like contact microphones. Now, this particular box here is really interesting. This is called the Leaf Audio Soundbox MK2. And what this is, it's basically a piezo microphone on acid. It's basically giving you this particular device to be able to amplify your sound, but it's adding to it a lot of gain adjustment. One of the challenges of this type of music or sound experiment is sometimes you have to really crank your preamp or really crank your gain on your mixer or whatever you're using to amplify your sound. This does it for you with these gain adjustments. And you could play both on the box directly and plug in an external microphone like I'm doing with this particular sound microphone here. And to give you a sense of what, what this is really all about, let's go ahead and just add an Alka-Seltzer tablet to this water. Again, the fizzing is going to then be picked up through these vibrations in this water piezo or contact microphone. And one of the things I want to point out this week is that if you're doing this kind of work, it may remind you of what folks in the movie industry called Foley work. Foley work basically involves sound effects, like creating the sound of the lightsaber in one of the Star Wars movies might be done through a variety of different means using these types of microphones, going out and doing field recordings, bringing those field recordings back and processing them. And what I can do is I can add this, I can take the sound from the microphone and then later modify it with different effects that allow me to process the sound and to make it usable, maybe even in a musical composition. So here's the Alka-Seltzer. Okay, so you get the idea of that. And again, it's an opportunity to really think about how you can use sounds in your everyday environment in some new ways. You may have never thought of using Alka-Seltzer before as a, a possible sonic um, exploration of, of the world around you. So I was just talking about this sound box and how it can be used. And what's pretty cool about this is you have all these accoutrements or sundry attachments that are provided to you. So you can put in things like tines from a kalimba, or you could put in screws, whatever you wanted. They actually include a mini kalimba here, and they include these springs. And what's really cool about this instrument is, again, it allows you to explore 
sound in a way that likely you haven't thought of exploring in this particular array. So just rubbing across the sandpaper creates a particular sonic moment. And what you could start to do is really convey like almost emotions or qualities to the sensory experience here of working with the sound. If you rub sandpaper, you think about kind of how the senses combine. You could think then if you're touching it, it feels rough. Does that sound, the auditory experience, correspond with your touch feeling or experience? And I think in this case it does. It doesn't always, but it's kind of interesting to think about the experience of texture. Again, to get into timbre and the quality of sound in the world um, around us, all the different sounds. The springs, similarly, each has a different quality to it and possible use. Scraping is a possibility, as is hitting it as a percussion instrument. And I'll show you some of my spring instruments later. Springs for me are some of the most amazing sonic devices out there because of their coiled nature. You get some incredible sounds and I'll show you that with one of my homemade percussion boxes. Again, the kalimbas can be played as well here, the times. And if you're thinking about instruments coming up in a few weeks and maybe building your own for a final project, consider the fact that having wood, not unlike if you made a cigar box, as an amplifier, as a resonator really, is going to allow you to really add to the sonic quality of what you're working with. Depending on whether you're using a microphone, a field microphone, or for some of this, a piezo. And this has built-in piezo microphones just like this particular one. So again, you can do a lot with these very simple percussive devices and everyday objects lying around the home. Uh, same thing with these on the side. And what I like about something like this is it really allows you to use this as a mini laboratory. You start to discover again the resonance of particular structures that you might mount your objects on makes a difference, as does the type of metal, the mounting of it. I've used electrical terminals to create some of my instruments and just listen to the difference of these sounds. Right, you can start to again almost describe the emotional or sonic quality of what you're hearing when you strike something like this. And sound designers are, of course, thinking about this, including folks who are making software instruments, often based on field recordings, and then translating that into computer objects or programs that allow you to play on a keyboard and then achieve some of these same sounds, but without really the fun of working in an actual space that involves air, vibration, microphones, various adjustments to surfaces, placement of microphones, and so forth. So it's one of the coolest things, I would say, about working with this type of equipment is not having a computer and really doing it in what we call a DAWless system. Uh, a DAW is a digital audio workstation. A lot of people are interested in doing more experiments in Eurorack or what we call this equipment, electroacoustic equipment, for the simple fact that sometimes the computer can be stifling and almost take away some of your creativity if you're trying to do some experiments with ambient sounds or Foley sounds in the sonic environments around you. You can also, of course, use objects to strike objects. So this is a snare from a snare drum. It just mounts on the bottom. And that's what produces that really distinctive sound of the snare that combines, almost like this hand drum. This is not a snare drum, but you would have this mounted inside. I can't really do it. Well, we'll try it here. Let's see if it... You actually do hear the buzzing of that. And so uh, this is something that's appropriated or reused from another instrument or a snare drum. So I can take this and because of the movement of these, they're almost like tines, but they're wires and they get tangled around and inside of each other. But this itself has a really interesting sound to it. I could just probably use it here with my contact microphone and we'll see what that sounds like. I'm not monitoring the sound as I'm doing this, so it'll be a surprise to me as well um, when I'm finished and I have a chance to listen to everything.
And then I can take it and strike it on these surfaces. And you see that the combination of these five times and also these wires create a pretty interesting sonic palette to work with. And if I wanted to, I could combine the piezo microphones that are picking up the vibrations with an air microphone. And one tip is if you're doing this, to definitely think about this, if you create any percussive devices like with springs, you're going to lose some of those high frequencies in your recording. So a great way to deal with that is to use a traditional microphone like this, a condenser microphone for instruments, and to create the sound from mixing of these different sources together. And that gets into the whole quality of working with mixers. And as I'm doing any of this, at the same time, I have my mixer running and I am, you know, potentially making adjustments to my gain and to my various channels because there's a lot that happens at the level of mixing. If you see that cool uh, film with Dave Grohl about the classic mixing console, I believe in Southern California, um, really shows you that the mixer itself is a form of art and it's an art in and of itself in terms of trying to create masters of albums of performances of different sonic experiments. So using devices like this is handy because it just allows you to create more versatility with the sound that you are you are working with. Um, so the other thing you can do with this is actually use a bow. And I don't have rosin on this, so I don't know if it's going to work, but we'll try it. Um, if you're using any kind of bowed instrument, and I do build some bowed string instruments, you just want to make sure that your bow is taut and uh, there's a little bit of rosin on here but rosin is really going to help particularly if you're working with strings if you're doing anything with a string instrument including a homemade string instrument and you don't have to break the bank on a bow but certainly there are better bows as you know if you're a string player and there are cheaper bows you could spend hundreds of dollars if not thousands um, the $15 ones are probably not going to do the trick, but $40, $50 generally, you get a pretty good quality. And you can see, I need a little more rosin on it. We're just picking this up on the mic here. And again, really start to appreciate how different objects are interacting in space at the same time. So what is it about a bow that has a surface that when coming into contact with strings, and these are, I believe, these are metal strings, so you would get a different effect with other types of strings. But just think about how revolutionary string instruments are in terms of the bow, and you don't probably think of this when you hear a symphony orchestra playing simultaneously, you know, 50 or more string players, but um, really amazing again to think about how objects combined create all these sonic and musical potentials. So if I'm going to use this in a more experimental way here, again, I could take my bow and let's just see what this sounds like. We'll find out later, but this is, I'm hearing a little bit of that. You're hearing this like resonance come out and we often get into if you play a guitar or a lot of instruments really um, undertones overtones and sort of qualities emerging in a sound in some ways where you're almost getting polyphony more than one note or tone or frequency sounding at the same time and we can try the other It sounds great. I'll be wanting to hear what it sounds like later. But again, a bow, just think about what an instrument is. It's, it's the sum of its parts, really, if you think about it. Now, this particular instrument, again, the MK-2, 
II sound box is an experimental sonic instrument. These used to be sold as kits by a company in the UK, and now they're only sold as complete objects. And indeed, there's a lot of circuitry inside here that allows you to really get a clean signal than you typically wouldn't get from cheap uh, $10 piezo contact microphones. The amplification the gain stage adjustments that allow you to take sounds that typically don't have a lot of resonance or amplification to them is what also makes this box really wonderful in so many ways. So one of the things that might be cool for some of you if you want to do a project, you can do something based on field recordings and you can actually use your phone pretty decent. You can also use one of these, which is a Zoom and Tascam and other companies make them. They are pretty good sound recorders that record everything to an SD card and you can adjust the gain, which is really important. You sometimes can't do so much of that on your phone. So that's why a device like this, which isn't super expensive, might be handy for you if you're thinking about a project with sound recording. The cool thing about the sounds in our everyday environment is we can amplify them and begin to understand sort of new impressions of our worlds because we don't typically listen carefully to the sounds around us. So again, I could take a toy, like this toy guitar, it's a, literally a dollar store guitar, and I can amplify it in different ways. This is using the Cortado microphone, and I could do the same with the sound box. And every microphone has a different use, a different purpose, and just like mixing consoles or instruments, different kind of violins or guitars, each has its own character to it. And so that's one of the cool things about doing these experiments. You can begin to understand what works and what doesn't. Something as simple like an everyday object like this, um, what do you call this, Newton's Cradle, I think it is, can actually be used. I've used this for percussion experiments, and it's pretty darn amazing. You wouldn't believe it. If I have um, a video of it, I will link that or splice it in with this video, but this is just showing you. What you might be getting into. So again, an everyday object around the house that is turned into a sonic device, an instrument, whatever you might want to call it. You can also take a music box, which again is going to work through vibrations. Nice resolution there. I love music boxes, and you can, by the way, buy um, that could be another cool project. You can buy your own music box that allows you to create your own paper. So if you go to Amazon, check out the music boxes that will play the actual paper. They're almost like scores, but they're like a player piano too because they feed through and cause the particular note to be played. But you could create your own experimental composition using one of those. It comes with a punch and then you punch the paper rolls and then you feed it through the hand crank feed it through the instrument, and then you play it with the hand crank. So that could be kind of cool as well. Um, a thing I've worked with in the past to really great and surprising success are these uh, kitchen timers, which allow me to create some interesting rhythmic percussive things. So if you hear it on its own, I'll put it on this microphone. You can listen to that. And then what, what I like to do actually is to take two of these and there we go, we get a little syncopation. They're not exactly in time. And over time, you can see, because these aren't precise, we're starting to get less syncopation, sort of sort of phases in and out. And that's what I really like about using something like these kitchen timers, because you can do some rhythmic things that you couldn't plan on your own. It reminds me a little bit 
of Stephen Reich, the experimental minimalist composer, his uh, clapping piece, where he's really experimenting with uh, phases of trying to bring in different rhythms. And our mind and its perception of rhythm it is very interesting just to consider as, as another conceptual issue. And there's also this, this principle of synchronicity where metronomes will eventually over time come in sync with one another which could be another cool project that you could think about so if you're dying for projects there are a lot out there and again every uh, everyday objects like kitchen timers really can lead you in some interesting sonic directions
nice. So next I want to show you just some homemade percussion instruments and get you thinking about, again, if, if you're interested in doing anything with a homemade instrument, you might consider some of the possibilities here. So I'm actually going to mic this in two different ways. And one of the things you can do if you're interested, let's try to get that in frame so you can actually see it. Um, you can get your own set of components to create some of these instruments. So this is actually a cigar box creation. I've added some switches. I've added a uh, different series of piezo microphones. They come in different sizes. These are going to give you a little richer sound, I found, than the smaller ones, which sometimes come pre-wired, which is pretty handy. And it's a very simple operation. If you're halfway decent with a soldering gun, you just have to take two wires. You're going to put one, solder it to the outside, the other one to the inside. And just make sure you don't have overlap. So one here and one there. And the red versus black, if you have two different color wires, doesn't matter at all. And then what you'd simply do is get one of these audio jacks. This is a standard quarter inch jack. And you're just going to solder then those two wires and you could even do this with electrical tape it won't be as solid a connection I'm just going to solder these two wires to your quarter inch jack and then you insert that in here and then that allows you to take it out and amplify it now again the sound sometimes is not as great i've discovered as the sound coming out of here because we have really clean components if you really want to get into this world of components and circuitry and do potentiometers and switches like I've done here, um, even um, kind of kill switches, which allows you to create almost like a stutter effect with the signal, it's a little bit of work. And if you're really thinking about clean sound with something like the Soundbox MK2, that involves certainly another level of work and understanding of electronics. You don't have to do something that fancy. Now, what I would also recommend to you is if you're getting into working with microphones that maybe you don't know how to attach, you can always use something like a clamp because having a real solid surface or connection here that isn't allowing the microphone to bounce around while you're playing could make a huge difference. So I'm just going to clamp this using a cheap uh, box door clamp. And then when I play on this, um, it's it's going to be a lot better for me because this is not going to be bouncing around. And I tend to use things like uh, skewers for um, kebabs or whatever, or these are wooden dolls you can get at a craft store or at a box store. And again, each of these items I've attached here have a different sonic quality to them. These are actually um, massagers for the head, and they create this really cool metallic sound that are that is great when you uh, hit it with a, um, a percussion type uh, beater. And one of the coolest things about doing this is you can customize your instrument. So just like on a kalimba, based on the length and the location, the mounting of the metal, and it could work for wood, and you can actually create a decent kalimba using popsicle sticks or even wooden skewers like I was talking about is that each of these will have a different tone to it. So depending on what you're working with, you might actually be able to identify the frequency or tone of what you're working with. And I was just going to try here. I have a handy tuner that I use for my string instruments. It may not work. We'll have to see here. But I was thinking, could I get the sense of the pitch involved in when I'm playing? I don't have any idea if this will work. So that's showing a C and also a B. And probably what's going on here is when I'm striking one of these tines or metal rods, it's vibrating another. So, you know, the best way to do this would be able to, and it might be hard to do, is to mute the rest of these and then strike it. You're thinking about tuning your head scratchers. You probably never thought of this. I've certainly never thought of it. So that's showing like a B flat. And I can actually compare that, 
play that along with a string instrument or a keyboard and see if that sounds approximately like a B flat. I'm suggesting this is because you can use everyday objects like back scratchers. This is a, um, uh, a mixer, a beater, a hand mixer for uh, whipping eggs and stuff. And again, you could, if you wanted to, think about even tuning some of the instruments that you've created. And these tuners are really accurate and fairly cheap. You can find them on Amazon. And again, they clamp on to a surface. And as long as you're getting um, sound being produced through that device, through like a resonator, then you're probably going to be able to tune whatever it is that you're working with. So what I like about this instrument, it allows me to do a lot of different things. And before I had the MK2 sound box, I sort of stole their idea and I took a pad from one of my sanders and put it here so I can create scraping sounds that are actually in some ways much harsher than the one on the actual MK2 sound box. And let's see if the stutter effect works. I don't know. This particular box, I had some issues when I wired it, and so I'm wondering if uh, this won't work. We'll just try it and see. And of course, as I'm hitting this, I'm getting some vibration from my fingers. So ideally, this would be external to the box, and I could hit it like that and create the stutter effect while I'm doing it. But in any case, it's another possibility there. So each of these, again, has a different sonic quality. These are a lot duller. These ring out almost like miniature chimes. They just have that really nice sound. And you're seeing these are moving, so we're also taking advantage of vibration and resonance, again, going through this cigar box. So in a real use of this, you would uh, attach um, you know, your neck to this and strings and you'd have a, a basically a cigar box guitar and you would also have that piezo hooked up. I also have a spring on here as well. So we can use it as a scrape and also a percussion. And this one you can hear much more, has more resonance and depth to it and a much lower pitch. It sounds just absolutely phenomenal just in the air and again I can take this amplify it, affect it, and have some amazing sonic potentials. I can also hook all of this up to what's called an envelope follower. So that's a device on my Eurorack that will basically take any percussive signal from one of my microphone sources and translate that into a gate sound. So as I'm hitting this, it's translating each of those beats, and then those beats can be playing one of my synthesizer modular units, and thus I could create this kind of sonic environment where I'm actually combining the acoustic performance with the electric and that's why we call it the electroacoustic experience. This, this is also kind of cool. I got this idea and I'll show you maybe on the instrument week the bigger version of this. I call it Sonic Forest, the bigger version. But it's basically... A series of guitar, cello, and other strings. And what I like doing with this is sometimes hooking it up to a motor or a device that's going to create on its own movement. And then it'll do something like this. And it creates some 
truly incredible sounds because again, the unpredictability, the resonance, the movement of these tines or metal rods on the two massagers, and then the unpredictability of not being able to control where these strings will end up and how long they'll, obviously after a certain time they'll stop moving, but I can automate this with a motor and create some really interesting effects that allow me to create just some, some different sonic potentials. So kind of a little bit there from how you might use an instrument like this. And let me just turn this over, if I can get it open to show you what it looks like on the inside. Um, again, if you're doing your own homemade instrument, I'm not expecting you to do like a big thing as far as doing the electronics, but it'll just be interesting for you to see what this looks like. It looks like I don't have any loose wires. But again, what I'm doing here is creating an instrument on the outside, on the inside, using these piezo microphones, I can amplify different parts of the box. I can hook these to a relay switch, and it's basically like different pickups on a guitar. So if I just want these playing or these playing, depending on how I wire it, um, I could adjust the switch there. So it's kind of another cool opportunity to think about doing maybe a little bit of soldering work on your own and creating your own musical instrument. Now here we have the more complex version of this, and this is a box I've been using for years. Um, it's actually one of my favorite instruments, one of my most versatile instruments. And actually what I'll do is I'll do a cutaway right now, just showing you what this sounds like uh, in a previous performance where I synced up various tracks of this box, and then we'll come back and talk about it. So as you got a chance to hear there, this has truly a lot of potential and I just want to, I'm going to just be lazy and stick this underneath the box, should work fine. This is actually a microphone uh, box from one of my microphones and I've repurposed it. It's not true wood, I think it's like a particle board, but I just found that the resonance once I experimented with it was really incredible. So I started to experiment with different size springs and found that I could create, you know, a bass section. And what you can do is, and I have a break there, a little bend, but um, it's, it's holding. You can experiment with size of spring. You could experiment with the tension, the way you mount it using these different, like these two inch long bolts um, or screws with, with the uh, nuts. Um, you could experiment with, you know, having it looser or tighter in terms of the tautness or the resistance that you have with your springs. And you can experiment with different types of springs because they're all going to have different sonic qualities to them. Again, to get a bass response, 
some of the longer springs, I can then use that and on top of it, almost like the treble or midsection would be here. It's kind of the midsection and then more trebly. And what I like to do is, not unlike the kalimba we talked about with the buzzers, is I like to sometimes have that very ringy and noisy sound by putting nuts on the top of some of these um, structures here, these, these uh, spring structures, because you create a little more noise there. You can also attach things like uh, bobby pins and paper clips to create your own mini kalimbas. And again, think about your own work if you're creating an instrument, what you can use to mount things. You can often discover that everyday objects like rulers, particularly this metal ruler, can be attached to this instrument and it has its own unique sonic quality. And you're hearing all that resonance through the instrument. That's just a really great opportunity there to create sonically something that sounds quite different than the rest of the instrument, which has a different metallic sound to it. You can also put washers on here, almost like these would be ride cymbals or hi-hats on a drum set, on a trap set. And you can do things like use these uh, door stoppers to create almost more like a sound effect. And you can mount guitar strings or cello strings using really simple, I just get dulcimer pegs and they're really easy to work with. They have a hole, you put your guitar string there and you can mount the second one using one of those or anything like this and just wrap it around. And then you tighten it with a screwdriver or if you're fancy, you'd get a dulcimer uh, tuning device that would allow you to tune it in the way that you want. But again, this is very easy to do. And you can even do this with fishing twine. Different gauge fishing twine is really wonderful for creating. In fact, this side had some fishing twine, but I took it off. It's really wonderful for creating instruments on the fly that could be combination percussion and string instruments. And so as you heard in that performance, I can really do quite a bit with this device. And even using the wood for again different resonance and different striking surfaces hitting one another. You could experiment with different beaters, you could use mallets, you could use plastic mallets, metal rods, um, anything really that you wanted to work with something like this. But uh, it's really the potential again to think about our sonic environments um, in some new ways and so hopefully get a chance just to think about some of these potentials as you're maybe working on projects in the future or as you're working through these next couple weeks where we're talking about soundscapes we're talking about instruments, qualities of sound, and also qualities of audio as well. So a lot to think about. I wanted to give you just a brief demo here looking at some of the setup and hopefully it will inspire you to either think about sound and music or to produce sound and music and potentially help you out with your future projects coming up. So thanks for listening. I'll be back with another video shortly.